and beyond for today is, is open. So we're meeting to talk about pseudo Boolean solving, which is what SAT solving people say when they talk about zero one integer linear programming. And we are, uh, our speakers are Daniel Leber and Romain Vallon. Um, and they're going to tell us about SAT4J, which is arguably the most well-known and I think definitely the most widely used pseudo-Boolean solver, uh, both in academia and industry. And uh, so they promised us an in-depth investigation of what's going on inside. And I think our setup for this week too is, um, but the, the speakers will make this clear that I think that there's a intention to have it divided up into two parts where you can leave halfway, uh, but like, so one hour regular seminar and then a break. And then after that, we go really deep and even deeper deep dive into technicalities. So without further ado, Daniel and Roman, please, the floor is yours. So thanks for the introduction and uh, for inviting us. So today we are going to see uh, what are the challenges uh, when we want to implement the CDCL algorithm in pseudo Boolean solvers. So uh, first, let me introduce uh, the context of pseudo Boolean solving. So in the early 2000s, there has been a resolution in the architecture of SAT solvers with both the adoption of the CDCL approach and the use of efficient heuristics and data structures, which allows, thanks to a, a kind of black box approach, to uh, make uh, SAT solvers work on a wide range of application problems without having to fine tune too much the solver to efficiently solve the problems. And we, with this, with this revolution, we got a two order of magnitude speed up on some benchmarks compared to previous generation of, of solvers. And now, uh, modern SAT solvers can now deal with problems containing billions of variables and clauses. So here is a brief overview of the CDCL architecture implemented in solvers. And here we are mostly going to focus on the proof system used by the solver, and more precisely in the conflict uh, analysis implemented in, uh, so in set solvers. And uh, in these solvers, we have, um, those, so the CDCL algorithm needs some invariance to, to work. And these invariants in set solvers are, that the, are the fact that constraint propagates only once. So basically we have clauses and once every literal but one are falsified, we propagate one literal. And those constraints have a single assertion level, which is the one where all literals but one are falsified. And with, uh, when a clause has all this, uh, propagates one literal, we say that it is a reason. And sometimes we have conflicts when all literals are falsified. And during the conflict analysis, we combine reason and conflicts. And we know in set solvers that combining a reason and a conflict will always produce a conflict. And finally, to detect the accession, so basically uh, when we learn a new constraint, we have a syntactical criterion to detect at which level we should back jump. And we will see that all these invariants will be broken when we consider them in a pseudo Boolean solvers. And here, uh, the pseudo Boolean solver we will consider is SAT4J, so an open source um, library for SAT solving in, uh, written in Java and developed since 2004, which supports pseudo Boolean solving and MaxSAT solving. It has native pseudo Boolean support and implements various. A proof system to uh, reason with a pseudo Boolean constraints, and the solver is available at sat4j.org. So now let us define what are pseudo Boolean constraints. So, and first, I want I would like to motivate the use of pseudo Boolean constraints by the fact that um, modern SAT solvers are very efficient in practice, as I said before, but some instances are completely out of reach for SAT solvers and especially because of the weakness of the resolution proof system that is used during conflict analysis. And this is particularly true for instances that require the ability to count uh, 
such as pigeon principle formulae, we state that you cannot put n pigeons into n minus one holes. And the, here, modern set solvers perform poorly if we have more than 20 pigeons. But pseudo Boolean solver based on cutic planes may solve uh, such instances in linear time. So let us see how we can represent uh, such problem with pseudo Boolean constraints. And a pseudo Boolean constraint in general is a constraint of this form, which is a weighted sum of literal where all coefficients are integers, literals are uh, li are literals, which means that we have a Boolean variable or its negation with the fact that the negation of a variable is equal to one minus this variable. In the more general way, we have any relational operator here among these five operators here. And the degree of the constraint, which is the um, right hand side of the constraint here, is also an integer. So for example, we have here a, a pseudo Boolean constraint with here uh, A, B, C, and D are literals. And we have uh, various kinds of coefficients. And without loss of generality, we are going to consider conjunctions of normalized PB constraints, which are of this form. So here, all coefficients are non-negative integers. And the degree is also a non-negative integer. And the relational operator is always uh, equal, is always at least here. So this is without loss of generality, the sense that any a pseudo Boolean constraint, as I defined before, can be represented in this form. So, for example, if we get the constraint um, I presented before, we can just rewrite it under this form just by applying basically um, a multiplication by minus one to have the right uh, relational operator. And uh, by using the equality uh, not v is equal to one minus v to make sure that all coefficients are positive integers. So there are some fun facts with uh, pseudo Boolean constraint uh, as this one. For example, here, without any assignment, we can see that this constraint propagates C to true. So indeed, if C is not satisfied, we can see that the maximum sum we can get on the left hand side would be eight. And since we need at least 10 here, C has indeed to be satisfied to satisfy the constraint. So here we can see that a PB constraint can propagate truth value without any assignment. And basically, a PB constraint can propagate multiple truth value at different decision levels. Since, for instance, here, if we satisfy C, it's not enough to satisfy the constraint. So later on, we will need to satisfy another literal that may be propagated. And actually, this constraint here is equivalent to C and the constraint in which C has been satisfied, which may be uh, more easy, uh, uh, easily written as C and A or B. And what is interesting to see here is that, for instance, in this representation, not D, uh, oh, sorry, it's A or not, it should be A or not B actually here. Yeah. And what we can see is that not D does not appear in this representation. And I will come back to this observation later on in this talk. So let us now consider our uh, pigeon principle formula I told you uh, before. So to represent this problem, we will use uh, Boolean variables pij to denote that a pigeon i is put in a in a hole j. And to state that a pigeon i should be in a in a hole, we just say that for each pigeon, at, it must be in at least one of the hole j using this constraint here, which is actually equivalent to a close. And to say that each hole cannot host more than one pigeon. We will use the at most one constraint here for each all to uh, represent uh, the, this, um, this fact. And then we will uh, 
be able to normalize it as I presented before. And now let us see how we can prove unsatisfiability on this formula. So first let's make it by hand uh, with, uh, on, so on this example. So first, as I said, we will normalize the Atmos one constraints in order to make sure that all constraints are normalized. And then we will just add, if we add all these constraints, so basically by adding constraints, I mean, we add the left-hand side together and the right-hand sides together. And when a uh, literal and its negation are present, we, they just cancel out by producing one. And with this addition, we get this constraint here. If we now add the constraint five plus the constraint six, then we get here three greater or equals to four, which is obviously false. And this is here uh, how we prove the unsatisfiability of the pigeonhole uh, print on this pigeonhole formula written using a pseudo Boolean constraints. So here I want to stress out that the constraints are indeed um, all pseudo Boolean constraints. And in theory, it is uh, constraints are often represented uh, in, CN, uh, in CNF, I mean, with clauses, uh, because we want to, um, to compare the proof system on the same input. So, um, and here, from a theory point of view, we do, we do not want our codings. We do not want, uh, well, we want to have the same constraints and uh, we need somehow to recover uh, the cardinality constraints if we start from the um, the original clauses. And Daniel will later on talk on how we can recover such constraints. But in practice, the way the constraints are expressed matters in the sense that, for instance, uh, it is easier to read uh, pseudo Boolean constraints, for instance, the Atmos one constraint is easier to read than the equivalent conjunction of clauses. And also the number of constraints is different because we need several clauses to represent the Atmos one constraint we have. And if we have uh, other constraints that are not clauses, we can use different inference rules. So for instance, using the cutting pens proof system to make the reasoning. And in practice, it is very important to have PB uh, constraints in PB solvers because if a uh, PB solver is given a CNF formula as input, it will simply behave as a slow SAT solver because it has many um, data structures to deal with pseudo Boolean constraints that will not be used in, since we only have clauses here. So let us now see how the solvers actually reason on pseudo Boolean constraints. And in many cases, uh, in particular in the case of SAT4j, the um, proof system that you use is one which is known as generalized resolution, which is composed of these two rules here. So the first rule is a cancellation rule, which states that if we have a literal in a constraint and the negation of this literal in another constraint, we can combine these two constraints in order to eliminate the literal L, and this will produce a constant since L plus not L is equal to one. So here what we do is we multiply this constraint by beta, we multiply this constraint by alpha, and the constant we get is this one with the constant produced by the addition of L and not L. And the other rule simply states that if coefficients are greater than the degree, then we can just replace the coefficient by the degree, and this will preserve equivalence. And with these two rules here, we can implement a conflict-driven constraint learning algorithm, which will combine reason and conflicts with these two rules to derive new constraints. So let us see uh, how it works in, in this example. So suppose first that we have this assignment. In, uh, so here, red literals mean that the literals are falsified, while green literals mean that the literals are satisfied. So if now C is falsified is this constraint here, we can see that not B must be satisfied to satisfy the constraint since otherwise 
it only remains three on this side. So not B is propagated here. And we say that this constraint is the reason for not B. But now, if we look at this other constraint, we can see that the left-hand side is only equal to five, while we need six, and it is not possible to have this six here. So this constraint is conflictual. So what we can do here is to perform a cancellation so as to eliminate B. So here is what we do. Here is what we do. So basically, here, since uh, the coefficient of node B is six and the coefficient of B is four here, we can just multiply this constraint by two to get 12 for node B and this constraint by three so that we, can, we get 12 for B and this will indeed eliminate the coefficient B and we get the constraint we have below. But now if we look at the left-hand side, we can see that um, we have 15 here and it is still possible to have six. So we have in total 21 here. So this constraint is no longer conflicting. So we have broken a CDCL invariant which, which states that when we combine reason and conflicts, we preserve the conflict. So we need to find a way to restore this conflict. And this is achieved, this is achieved, achieved <coughs> by the weakening rule. So this rule allows to remove a little wall from a constraint by decreasing the degree of this constraint. So for instance, here, if we want to eliminate L, we just remove it and decrease the degree by the coefficient of L. And we can also partially weaken the literal by decreasing, uh, sorry, I have an example for this. So um, here, if we want to weaken C away, we just decrease the uh, degree by three and we get this constraint here. And for uh, partial weakening, we can just decrease the coefficient and the degree by the same amount. So here, for instance, we decrease the, the coefficient of L by K and the degree. And here, we can decrease the coefficient of B by two. And we, by, we can also decrease the, uh, the degree by two to get this constraint, which is entailed by the original constraint. So this rule can be applied, and we will see uh, later how, to um, preserve conflicts. But there are actually many different ways to apply uh, it to preserve conflicts. So the original approach is to just weaken away little walls from the reason, and we repeat the operation until we have the conflict, we get a conflicting constraint thanks to the application of this saturation rule. Indeed, if we just weaken away little walls in itself, it will not modify the conflict status of the constraint. It, it will be the, actually the application of the saturation rule that will guarantee to derive a conflicting constraint. But here, with this operation, we need to repeat multiple times to just weaken, saturate, check whether the conflict is preserved, and redo until we have uh, preserve the conflict. So this, the, the cost of this operation is not negligible in practice. So we need another solution, which takes advantage of this property given by Dixon, which says that if the coefficient of the little world to be canceled out is equal to one in at least the conflict of the all the reason, then we know that the derived constraint will be conflicting. So the idea is just to make sure that this coefficient will be equal to one, thanks to the application of the weakening rule. Our first approach is to weaken away ineffective little walls. So these little walls are those that do not play a role in the conflict, which is also quite which is also different compared to set solvers because in clauses all little walls uh, in a clause are play a role in either the propagation or the conflict for this clause. So we can, in the case of PB constant, we can, we can in effectively table the way and let's see this on an example. So let us suppose that we have this constraint under this current partial assignment. 
So here we can see that node B has to be propagated because otherwise we are, will only have uh, D and E that remain and they will not be able with the uh, not A already satisfied to produce the six we want. But if we need to propagate uh, node B, it's really because of falsified literals actually, because satisfied literals do not impact the fact that the constraint is conflicting or not. It's really falsified literals. So here's the idea is to weaken away all ineffective literals and to apply the saturation rule. And this will guarantee that the coefficient of the literal, of the propagated literal here, which is not B, will be one, since actually using this approach will always derive a clause. And there is also uh, something that is quite interesting is that actually some falsified literals may also be ineffective. So for instance, if we have this conflicting constraint in which all literals are falsified, then we can choose one of the literals that has coefficient one. So for instance, let's say C, and this literal is, a, is ineffective. So we can also have chosen B or F. So it's, it depends on what, um, maybe we can use heuristics to choose um, which literals to weaken away. And here indeed, if we weaken C away, we get this clause, which is still conflicting. And this approach is actually equivalent to the, the approach implemented in solvers such as satire or subfordia resolution, which lazily infer clauses to use a resolution-based reasoning during conflict analysis instead of a cutting planes uh, reasoning. But it is actually quite slower because uh, the way it is computed is not the same. Roman, a question? Yes. Uh, so if you go back to uh, this example, yeah, the, the, so the, the fact that you can remove C and still have a conflict, uh, do you, is there like, did you have some algorithmic way of deciding this or you, you're just illustrating that we could have done this and you leave open like what would be the procedure for identifying such? So uh, basically uh, the idea is that uh, we can uh, we can literal away in this case if its coefficient is strictly less than the degree. Mm. Okay. And it will uh, so basically we just algorithmically speaking we uh, we can away all literals that are not falsified. And then we can apply um, the weakening progressively to uh, if the if we weaken away a, a literal with coefficient less than the degree, we know that we will not derive um, a tautology. And since all literal are falsified, we know that it will uh, remain conflicting. I see, because you're saying, yeah. Because since the coefficient is smaller than the degree, I mean, it's, it's not only C is failing to contribute enough, someone else must also be failing. So even if you remove C, then you, you can, there's still blame to go around for the other guys. And that's why you still have a conflict. Yes. Okay, got it. Thanks. So another way to uh, get um, a coefficient of one for the, coefficient on which the cancellation rule will be applied is the approach proposed in rounding set, which is to um, apply the division rule so as to make sure that the coefficient of uh, the propagated uh, or conflicting uh, literal will be uh, equal to one by dividing by its coefficients. And to make sure to preserve conflict, the idea is to weaken away uh, some unfalsified literals. And I will show you this on an example. So first, uh, I want to show that the division rule simply states that we can divide all coefficients and the degree by the same amount. And then we round up uh, coefficient and degrees. So um, the uh, approach proposed in rounding set here, if we want, for instance, to uh, perform the um, 
cancellation on the literal b here. So the coefficient of b is seven. So here we have some coefficients that are not divisible by seven. And the approach of rounding set is to weaken away all unfalsified literals that for which the coefficient is not divisible by seven. So here, the idea is to weaken away a, since a is not divisible by seven, and f. And we will get this constraint here. Then this constraint is divided by the coefficient of b, which is seven, and we get this clause here. And another approach may be to apply partial weakening. So for instance, here, instead of completely weakening a away, we can just weaken it partially so that its coefficient become seven instead of eight. So we just, or instead of decreasing the coefficient of the degree, sorry, by eight, we will decrease it by one only. So actually there are many different uh, variants of this strategy because as I said, the idea of all these strategies is to have the coefficient of the literal on which the constellation rule is applied equal to one in at least one of the constraints. So the, we can either apply the weakening on the conflicting constraint or on the reason or on both. So what we can see here is that uh, for the different weakening strategies I presented here, the more in, uh, the, the one having the best performance is um, SAT4J partial running set, which is an implementation of running set in SAT4J, which uses partial weakening and which applies the weakening on both constraints. Then we have uh, the implementation of running set in SAT4J and the weakening of ineffective literature in both constraints. So here we, we can see that in a sense, applying the weakening on both constraints uh, is in general better than applying it in only one constraint. And one thing which is quite surprising here is that um, the, after, the, after having applied on both, the best strategies are applying only on the conflicting constraints. And this is surprising because since the early development of PB solvers, the weakening has only been applied on the reason and here, this experiment suggests that it is actually better to do this on the conflict. So, and now that we have, uh, thanks to the weakening rule, we, are, we know that we are, can preserve conflicts and restore this invariant. But we need now to know when to stop the analysis. Oh, sorry, when, just another, so, yes. sorry for being slow. Another question if you go back. So the, the, if, if we look at these plots, the point is that for all of these solvers, you're taking one, one rule, one strategy, and you're using it consistently. Yes. Uh, yes. And then you have the virtual best solver that is beating yes. everything by quite a bit. So yes. just to point out if we, for the, I, I'm thinking for the Simons program as a, like a, a research question is like how, if, if some additivity could help close the gap between the VBS and all these fixed alternatives, right? Mm. Yes. And maybe one thing we thought about is maybe to, to try to use some algorithm selection techniques to, uh, try to combine these this strategies by trying to identify which seems to be the best and to maybe combine the best of all strategies to reach the VBS. Yeah. So, uh, and now to when we have preserved the, the conflict thanks to the application of the weakening wall, we need to know when to stop the analysis because in SAT solvers, we know that we can stop when the uh, derived clause contains only one literal that is assigned at the current decision level. And we know that the back jump is performed at uh, the decision level, which is the deepest except of course the current one. And we know that we can back jump up to this um, decision level. But in case of uh, pseudo-Boolean solvers, we have no such syntactical detection actually. 
because to identify the, back, the highest back jump level that we, to which we can back jump, we need to uh, consider the weights of the literal since uh, a pseudo Boolean constraint, as I said before, may propagate uh, uh, literals at different decision levels. So we need to identify the decision level, the first decision level at which this, uh, con the constraint propagates at least one literal. And this, this is, we need to do some more computations compared to uh, set solving. So this is yet another invariant of uh, CDCL that we have broken here. So, but we have also uh, an Achilles heel in the cutting planes proof system, which is the fact that uh, some literals may be irrelevant in the constraint produced by the proof system. So here, for instance, uh, if we want to cancel D out in these two uh, constraints, we will just uh, add them since the coefficient is already the same. And we get this constraint here. And we can see that uh, the literal C is irrelevant in the sense that its truth value does not have an impact on the truth value of, uh, the, uh, of the constraint. And actually, if uh, you recall the, one of my first examples in which we have uh, written a, um, a constraint, then one literal had disappeared when we uh, add the representation C or A and not B. And this is typically the case when we have irrelevant literals in a pseudo Boolean constraint. So uh, this is what I said about uh, irrelevant uh, literals that does not have an impact on the truth value of the constraint. But what is interesting here is that irrelevant literal may be removed from the constraint while preserving equivalence. So here, C can simply be removed and we will have equivalence. So we made some experiments and uh, found out that Many relevant literals are actually produced uh, by Set4j in um, many uh, different uh, families of benchmarks. So here we have uh, box plots which states for each family of instances how many irrelevant literals were produced. So for each box, we have the minimum and maximum which are represented here. And the, the horizontal bars here are the um, so the as um, the cartil of the distribution and the horizontal bar in the middle is the median. So we can see that we can have many irrelevant literals produced during conflict analysis, and sometimes more than ten thousand, for instance, in the case of uh, Euclid PB benchmarks. So irrelevant literals are not only uh, theoretic problems; they are indeed produced in PB solvers. But the problem is really when these literals become artificially relevant. So let's see what it means on this example here. We have, um, the, so here the constraint I presented before with uh, the literal C, which is irrelevant. And we have here this other constraint in which C is also irrelevant for the similar reasons as for this constraint. But if we, combine these two constraints to eliminate the literal A, we get this constraint here, which is equivalent to this clause. And of course, this is, since this is a clause, C is relevant since in all uh, tautological non-tautological clauses, and non sorry, since for non-tautological clauses, all literals are always uh, relevant. But here, observe that if the irrelevant literal C had been removed in the original constraint, it would not appear in the derived constraint here. So we would get the clause B or D instead of the clause B or C or D, which is stronger than the clause we derived, which means that because of irrelevant literals, we can produce weaker constraints during conflict analysis. But the problem is that 
detecting whether a literal is relevant is NPR. So we can not just say, okay, we, maybe some literals will be irrelevant, we will remove them and uh, we will have a stronger constraint. No, this, this is more complicated. So we propose an incomplete algorithm to remove uh, irrelevant literals from the constraint. And to this end, we will use this reduction to the subset sum problem. So here we have that a literal L is irrelevant in the constraint here if this equality has no solution for K in one to alpha. So let's, uh, me ex let me explain this a little bit. So intuitively, if we have, uh, if uh, here we have indeed a solution to this equality. This means that this solution will not in itself be a solution to this constraint here, because the, we do not have delta, we have less than delta since we, since we have delta minus k. But if we uh, satisfy L at this point, then we will go from a model, from a counter model, sorry, of the constraint to a model of the constraint, since alpha plus delta minus k because of this interval will be greater than delta. So the, the literal will be relevant. So this is the intuition behind uh, this reduction here. So here, for instance, C, C is irrelevant in this constraint because it is not possible to have one for this equality and two for this equality. So we can, with this reduction to subset sum, apply the classical dynamic programming algorithm to detect whether a literal is irrelevant or not. And um, more interestingly, since this algorithm compute all possible sums, we will know in, this, in a single run of the algorithm whether there exists a solution for one of the equalities to consider. And this will be in pseudo-polynomial time, thanks to the dynamic programming algorithm. The problem with this algorithm is that it depends on the value of the degree of the constraint. And in practice, uh, the degree may be very big in the derived PB constraint. So it would be not efficient enough to simply solve subset sum on the constraint. So we need an incomplete approach to solve uh, these subset sum instances. And to this end, we will use um, a modulo approach because what we want to know is to make sure that a literal is irrelevant before removing it. So basically what we want is to make sure that the literal we remove are irrelevant. We thus allow to consider as relevant literals that are irrelevant because what this allows to simply remove literals without considering its coefficient as I represent in uh, the next slide. So we can allow to miss irrelevant literals and this can be applied thanks to an um, application of such algorithm modulo a fixed number. So basically here, instead of uh, computing the subset sum, the, uh, the possible sums, uh, the real possible sums, we will compute them modulo the chosen number. And the intuition is that if uh, the a sum exists, then it will also exist modulo. And similarly, if no sum exists, it will not exist modulo. So if we cannot find the solution to the subset sum problem modulo the chosen number, then we are sure that the literal will be irrelevant. And we can even uh, compute the subset sum solutions on several numbers to make sure that, um, well, to improve the accuracy of the algorithm since the probability uh, of um, making an error will decrease if we have different numbers. Since basically, uh, if as soon as it is not possible to find um, a sum 
modulo one of the numbers, we know that it is not possible, for, and it will not be possible without considering the modulo here. So now, when we know that a literal is irrelevant, we can just remove it while preserving equivalence since the literal are irrelevant. And there are two ways to do so. So here, if we consider this example, we can just locally assign the literal C to uh, zero, since we know that it is irrelevant. And if, we do, and if we do so, we just actually remove it from the constraints and we get this constraint here. We can also assign it to one, which is actually equivalent to the weakening approach to get this constraint here, which is which will actually, because of the saturation, will be equivalent to A or B. And we can see that this constraint is also equivalent to A or B. So here there is no difference. But in practice, there may be some difference and some constraint, it may be preferable to use one of the approach or another one. And we use a heuristic to decide which strategy to apply because as I said, sometimes it may be better to use one strategy and some other times it may be better to use another one. So we implemented the removal uh, in uh, set for J and uh, we can see here uh, the difference, the impact on the size of the proof bit by the solver. So here we consider the size of the proof because the algorithm remained costly so uh, we and we wanted to really evaluate the impact on, of the relevant literals on the strength of the reasoning made by the solver. So we can see that there is no clear difference because there are points over and below and they are, they are quite uh, equally uh, divided into be, uh, below and above the, the red line here. But what is interesting here is this particular family, which has vertex cover instances. And we will consider them here uh, more specifically. So what we did here is that we generated more instances of this family to see whether uh, the trend is confirmed. And indeed, we can see that uh, the number of um, cancellation steps applied during conflict analysis is exponentially smaller when we remove your relevant little words. And actually, if we look at the behavior of uh, Sat4j on this family, we can see that the first constant learned by the solver has this form here, where n is a scale parameter of uh, the instance. And uh, what we can see is that all literals x1 to xn minus 1 are irrelevant, since they are not enough to uh, make this side uh, greater than n and x, uh, if x is satisfied, it obviously satisfies the constraint. And actually, this constraint is equivalent to the unit clause x. And what is also interesting on this family is that no other irrelevant literals are detected in the other constraint derived by sat for j, which means that even few irrelevant literals produced at the very beginning of the exploration of the search space may lead to the prediction of an exponentially larger proof. And this um, tends to suggest, uh, this suggests that it is really important to um, find a way to avoid the production of irrelevant literals since detecting them is very costly. And this is what is uh, shown on this scatter plot here where we uh, compare the runtime of the solver with and without the detection of irrelevant literals really in terms of time here. And we can see that the solver is much slower in general when this uh, uh, the removal of the relevant literal is activated because of the cost of the algorithm. So here, we, we instead of removing them, it would be very interesting to avoid producing them in the first place. And a possibility is to uh, actually use one of the rules I presented before about the weakening of ineffective literals. So recall that, for instance, we have ineffective literals here because here they are not um, falsified. And here this one has a coefficient that is uh, lower than the degree. 
So in this case, we can consider them as locally irrelevant in the sense that if we uh, simplify uh, the constraint here, for instance, by saying that, okay, not A is satisfied, so we can um, say that this is equal to three, so we move it to the right-hand side and we get three here. This literal is simply removed, it is not, it is not uh, falsified, it is falsified, sorry. And the constant that remain is actually uh, three, not B, three not B plus D plus C greater than three. And D and not E are um, irrelevant in this case. And um, we can just say that they are irrelevant under the current partial assignment. Whereas um, the irrelevant that I presented before were globally relevant independently of the current assignment. And here it is easy to detect the ineffective literals compared to the globally relevant literals. So we can make sure that irrelevant literals are removed by the weakening of ineffective literals. However, here we, are, we, we must apply the weakening rule Whereas for irrelevant literal, we can just we could just simply remove literals from the constraint, because here we are not sure that uh, the literals are irrelevant. And indeed, for instance, not A, D, and E are relevant in the constraint; they are only ineffective. So we, this is why we need the weakening rule instead of the simple removal. But uh, this leads to the inference of uh, weaker constraints, since, as I said, we only derive clauses here. And the main idea of removing irrelevant literals were in, was in the first place to um, have stronger constraints. So here we, we need to find uh, just middle between removing um, all irrelevant literals and removing more than the irrelevant literals, which is uh, too... Um, uh, it's too much uh, in terms of um, maintaining the strengths, if we want to maintain the strengths of the constraints. Okay, so now we've seen that we need to um, adapt some things if we want to uh, the, our, the cutting pens proof system to fit in the CDCL architecture, but we can also um, further adapt PB solvers to the CDCL architecture. Because here, so for the moment, we mostly consider the conflict analysis um, procedure, but there are also other uh, important features in CDCL, such as the decision heuristics, the uh, deletion of land clauses, and the uh, restart policy. And it is well known that these features are very important for set solvers to be efficient. So, we need to adapt them in uh, PB solvers because currently most of these heuristics are reused as is from SAT solvers without considering the particular properties of PB constraints. And what we found out is that if we consider the size of the coefficients or the current partial assignment when computing the heuristics or uh, choosing the which constraint to delete and when to restart, then we can significantly improve the solver and in particular set for j in this case. So if we consider, for instance, the, uh, <clears throat> the implementation of the generalized resolution in set for j, we can see that from the, uh, the default implementation, which uses um, strategies inherited from set solving, we can uh, incrementally improve it until the best combination we have here and uh, I will present later on which are the uh, different strategies here. And we have uh, similar observations for the implementation of running set in set for J and the implementation of um, partial, uh, funding set in set for J with the uh, use of the partial weakening rule um, 
used to maintain um, conflicts during conflict analysis. And here is a comparison of uh, sat for j uh, with a running sat, and uh, the diff in particular the different implement uh, the different strategies implemented in um, in sat for j, and we can see that from the default implementations of sat for j generalized resolution and the two implementation of running set in sat for j, we can almost reach the um, the performance of running set only by applying the best um, the, uh, the combinations of the best strategies. And thanks, to if we, in addition to this, if we uh, compute, uh, if we compute no, if we use um, uh, both version of Set4j, which combine the in parallel the cutting cutting plane based inference and resolution based inference. We have quite competitive results in Set4j here, both because of uh, the resolution proof system, which is um, efficient, on, which remains efficient on some benchmarks, and thanks to the uh, different uh, uh, adaptations of the strategies uh, I just I presented briefly um, in the previous slide. So that's it for the first part of this presentation. So if you have any question, uh, please let me know. Thanks a lot, Roman. Uh, so there was, in fact, one question that was discussed in the chat already, but I'm bringing it up just because I don't think the chat makes it into the recording that is posted afterwards. So Mate Sauce asked, has it been tried to use statistics and machine learning uh, to supervise learn the best strategy uh, to get closer to VBS. So this he was asking long ago in the context of these, um, I think in, in the context of these different weakening strategies. Uh, but of course, you could also consider it in, in the context of this bumping also. And uh, Daniel Leber asked that this has not been done. Um, and I guess, yeah, so, so I don't know if you want to add anything to this while we're uh, thinking about other questions to ask you. Uh, well, uh, actually, we have uh, some, um, we have a, as perspectives the idea of uh, using uh, machine learning to uh, try to find uh, the best strategies, uh, maybe using, uh, as I said earlier, uh, automatic algorithm uh, configuration or other, uh, other strategies that we have in mind, but this is uh, on, a, on our to-do list, say. I mean, one can also discuss, I guess, whether, whether you want to throw machine learning at this or whether we want to understand what's happening. I mean, you could also Im imagine that you some, have some principled way of, of choosing in between different rules. Like for instance, uh, if you have uh, several different alternatives at every step in the conflict analysis, maybe you try all of them. Now you get a bunch of candidate constraints and you compare them and check which one looks best and then continue with this. So I think this might be, as, as if I, so I'm not very good at mixed integer linear programming, but as far as I understand, when they do cut generation, for instance, they um, generate lots and lots and lots of different cuts and then they look at them and have some heuristics for saying, oh, I, I like the, these ones. They will, will keep these and will throw away the rest. So yes. I, I think we haven't been doing this in SAT and pseudo boolean so uh, Any, I have tons of questions, but I, you know, I shouldn't hog all the time I'm looking in the chat or if someone wants to unmute and ask anything. You know, you know, if you don't do it, then I will ask another question soon. Okay, so maybe while, while people are thinking, another question, if you go back to the plot that you just had. Do you, yeah. Do you know what this, I mean, it's, it's a very uh, flattering picture, I guess for rounding set, so I shouldn't complain. But I'm wondering, th this might also be because you're measuring running time, 
So I wonder if would you have the same the same plot, but but using some proxy for for you know the quality of the proof search, such as if you, if you plotted number of conflicts instead, would it look the same, or would the solvers be much 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 closer? Uh, well, I, I'm not sure. I made it for all experiments. I made some. Uh, uh, at some point, but I'm not sure. I, I think I made it for to compare different variants in self-OJ, but not with running sets. Uh, during uh, well, while I was uh, making these experiments, but uh, it should not be too uh, hard to uh, to draw uh, other plots. Uh, I still have all uh, all low, so it it should be uh, easily easy to uh, to draw the other plots and check this. Uh, because I'm, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's yeah. like it would be because it, it's it. I mean, it could still be that maybe for some reason rounding set is really good, or it could be that no, no. If you're if if they would be like if you would have a level playing field, then actually these latest uh, optimizations of yours are actually way better. Yeah. So this is someone is asking. Uh, how much Paul Beam is, is asking how much of the difference is, is Java versus C++, Java versus C++, and Daniel Liber is asking probably a factor of three, four. Um, yeah, well, I mean, maybe I can comment on this. In uh, 2011, uh, there was a version of Minisat written by Kirsten Sims uh, called JMinisat, and uh, that was reproducing exactly the, the behavior of Minisat, and there was a factor of 3.25 or something like this uh, between uh, J Minisat and Minisat. So, but uh, it's complicated to, to, to say that because there are things to, you cannot really do uh, in Java that you can do in, in C and C++. So there are uh, features that Armin presented uh, in his talk uh, the first week that are hardly done. I don't know how to do them uh, on with Java. So, I mean, uh, you have to pay a price, but there is also the just-in-time compiler that also, uh, on some cases, uh, also does a pretty good job. So, well, it's um, uh, ten. Well, okay. Uh, it's it, yeah. The, there are cases uh, uh, clearly set for day is not for there for speed, right? But um, well, I mean, so it's it's not. Uh, I, I think it's it's quite. Okay, uh, and uh, maybe something we, we should mention is, so uh, uh, there is a difference between rounding set one and rounding set two based on the use of arbitrary um, precision arithmetic. And I, I think this is something we have in Java. We know that it's slow, but um, this is what we use. And uh, so uh, SAT4J could be more efficient using uh, uh, just uh, primitive types, but uh, then there would be issues with with overflows, so uh, yeah, I mean, it's a trade-off. Uh, yeah, but you would see some. I mean, you you'd eliminate you you'd get us some feeling for what's going on by just comparing conflict counts because that's that's somehow a proxy or or you know that like the total sum of the length of all conflict analyses or something that would tell you something. So there are uh, a number of comments in the chat that I'm again reading out because I don't think they make it onto the recording otherwise. Um, regarding the speed up from Java to C++, uh, Kieran McCreech is saying that for subgraph solving, uh, which is more bit parallel, the factor is over 10. And then Kieran had another comment. Actually, I don't know if you want to unmute and, and elaborate, Kieran, regarding this question of th this heuristic figuring out whether a pseudo Boolean constraint is good or bad. There are some heuristics used in some constraint programming solvers for when to use strong propagation for linear equalities. Do you want to elaborate? Yes. So um, uh, I'll talk about this more tomorrow in the encoding session, but. Um, for linear inequalities, um, doing the perfect propagation is, is NP hard. It's again, it's a subset, some kind of thing. Um, but some solvers will look and see, okay, if um, the coefficients are small, the number of variables are small according to some carefully calculated set of heuristics, it will turn the um, linear inequalities into what's called a table constraint. Um, 
which is effectively a, a DNF representation of a constraint in some forms. So um, this is something that constraint programming solvers do automatically. They will uh, rewrite the constraints that you put in. Um, might be worth having a look at the heuristics that CP solvers use to decide when to do this as well. Right, this is also a good uh, time to, to advertise uh, that uh, because this, this encoding question also came up as, as Roman mentioned, if you have a problem and you want to use a pseudo Boolean solver, please make sure not to encode it in conjunctive normal form um, because that's a very bad idea. Try to write it as, as more you know, natural pseudo Boolean constraints instead. This is connected also to the question of encodings and there will be a a workshop seminar tomorrow at 5.30 Central European time, I guess, uh, about precisely different encoding problems. Any other questions for Roman before we take a 10 minute break? So I think not. Then why don't we? So so it's now three minutes, thirty three minutes past the hour in whatever time zone you're in. Except if you're in India, I guess then it's three minutes past the full hour. So you know, even you're trying to be generic and still you can't be generic enough. So let's uh, reconvene in ten minutes from now for those of us who wants to go even deeper into the pseudo Boolean solving deep dive. Okay, but for now we're taking a break. Thank you. <laughs> 
So we are preparing to restart in just a few seconds. Uh, we're having fascinating discussions about time zones in the chat while we're waiting. Uh, Nepal is apparently 45 minutes off the standard time zones together with Chatham Island and Austra Australian Central Western Time. There you go. Um, any other questions that have arisen while we were having the break before we let Daniel and Roman loose again? Feel free to unmute, uh, especially now, I think during the second half, people who, and if you want to ask a question and you can't because you're a um, an attendee rather than a panelist, then there's a way of promoting you so that you can unmute and speak. Just send a message in the chat and we'll take care of it in no time. But I see no questions. So I guess, Daniel, that means it's over to you again. Okay, so um, let's now make a deeper dive into Set4J. And first, I want, I would like to uh, come back to the fine tuning of Set4J with a different strategy by the, uh, giving some more details on how we implemented the, the variants of the CDCL strategies. So let's consider again a conflict analysis with these uh, two constraints here. So first we say that, okay, B is satisfied, C is falsified, D is falsified, which propagates not A and not F. And then we have here a conflict. So we apply the cancellation rule to derive a new constraint. And here this constraint is learned because if we uh, come back to uh, decision level here two, we can see that uh, we propagate uh, a here. Yes, we propagate A at this point. So now we can see that uh, the PB constraints that are involved in the conflict analysis and the constraints that is learned at the end of conflict analysis are quite different compared to the clauses that are um, handled by uh, SAT solvers. So first, let's see uh, how um, uh, V seeds and EV seeds in the case of uh, mini set based uh, solvers can be um, changed to take into account the properties of uh, PB constraints. And first, I will briefly recall uh, how it works. So, basically, all variables that are encountered during conflict analysis get bumped uh, to, uh, improve, to increase their score, their EV seed score. So, if we do this for uh, pseudo Boolean constraints, we will bump all variables of the reason here, for instance. So not A, not F, D and E will be bumped at some point. So we will increase and increment the score. But uh, so as I said, this is, does not, this is not exactly um, the same thing as for clauses since the literals do not have the same role in the constraint. So an approach that has been that has been proposed in, um, in um, for adapting V seeds is to take into account only the original cardinality constraints. And uh, the problem is that if we only consider original cardinality constraints, we do not consider um, long constraints and um, long cardinality constraints and any PB, general PB constraint. So this does not uh, solve our problem of um, adapting these seeds to uh, PB constraints. So here we can take into account the uh, coefficients uh, into uh, three new strategies, which are uh, bumping the degree of um, the constraint. So basically here, we, um, we just estimate the, the row estimate of the, uh, of the number of clauses because this is uh, how it is it works for cardinality constraints since the degree is equivalent is, a, is equal to the number of clauses needed to represent the cardinality constraint and this is what is done in a uh, 
the VC the, uh, adaptation of uh, Dixon. And we just wanted to uh, generalize this, uh, this strategy here. We can also bump the coefficient to uh, try to uh, estimate the role of the coefficient. So here, a, a and f, for instance, will be uh, bumped by three in this case, d and e. And we can, we can also make a ratio of uh, the degree by the coefficient if we want to uh, generalize both the approach of uh, Dixon to bump by the degree and to take into account the um, coefficient of the literal and do the role of the um, of the literal in the constraint. So we implemented uh, all these strategies in the J and also another strategy, which is uh, uh, the ratio uh, coefficient by degree, which is actually uh, an approach which was proposed in Pueblo, which is instead of uh, dividing the degree by the coefficient, we just divide the coefficient by the degree, which estimates uh, the the impact the the role of the literal in the the relative impact of the literal in the constraint compared to all the other literals, and we can see that this is the uh, only uh, strategy that is better than uh, the default approach uh, when we consider at least coefficients. But this is. Coefficients are not the, the only difference between PB constraint and clauses. And in particular, assignments do not play the same role with uh, PB constraint and clauses. So here, for instance, there are unassigned uh, literal in the reason. There are satisfied literal in the reason that were not propagated at this point. And uh, this is quite different compared to clauses when, uh, because when we have a reason, we know that all literals are, are falsified, except one, which is the one that is propagated. So we need to uh, know which literals are involved in the propagation. So we have the, we know that falsified literals are, uh, are most, most likely to be involved in the constraint, but there, are, there is also the notion of effective literals I presented before. And we know that some uh, falsified literals may do not have an impact on uh, the propagation. So we consider uh, other strategies, so uh, which is uh, which are the bump assigned. So we only bump literals that are assigned by uh, the um, current assignment. Bump falsified, which bump only literals that are falsified. And bump effective, which only bump literals that are effective. So here, um, so I forgot to say that we also uh, bump uh, the literal that is um, propagated. So this literal will always be satisfied since it is propagated, but it is involved in the conflict since uh, propagating this literal um, leads to a conflict. So this is why we also bump uh, not F here. Would you remind us what an effective variable is? Yes, so uh, it's... Uh, so uh, an effective variable is always uh, first falsified. And if we uh, remove all, uh, by weakening all literals that are not falsified, if coefficients of literals uh, are smaller than the degree, then we consider these literals are ineffective. So uh, stated uh, otherwise, uh, Ineffective literals are literal for which if we weaken these literals away, the conflict is preserved or the propagation is preserved here. Yeah. So because the intuition behind this is that we want to uh, bump really the literals that are involved in the conflict and effective literals are really those that are involved in the conflict. And when we implemented all these strategies in sat j we can see that actually all these new strategies are better uh, than the default um, implementation, which bump all literals that are encountered during conflict analysis, whatever the current assignments. And we can see that indeed, um, 
the the idea of this strategy is to um, really bump literals that are involved in the conflict uh, allows to uh, improve the solver because uh, each time we get more precise on what we mean by involved in the conflict, we in, indeed uh, improve the performance of the solver here. And as we can see, the bump uh, effective uh, strategy is indeed the, the best of the strategies we have here. And just to check that we're on the same page and to understand that the point is that if we look at these three strategies that you had on your last slide, in the conflict in the in the context of conflict driven clause learning, there is no distinction because they're all the same. It's like yes. it's impo it's impossible to tell which one of these three CDCL does because they're all the same. But when you lift from clauses to pseudo boolean constraints, then you see the difference. Yes, indeed. Okay, thanks. So another way to adapt uh, classical CDCL strategies in pseudo Boolean solvers is to consider the measure for qual the quality of learned constraints. So basically in SAT solvers, uh, at some point we need to delete clauses because uh, if we have too many uh, learned clauses, then it would slow down unit propagation and use a lot of memory. And uh, we need uh, to uh, remove some of them and to choose which to remove, we need a quality measure. And this quality measure may also be used to uh, trigger restarts as proposed in glucose, for instance. Uh, but um, once again, if we use the quality measure used in SAT solvers, they do not consider the properties of uh, PB constraints and we can adapt them to uh, better measure the, the quality of learned PB constraints. So first we have the size of the clauses, which is a naive quality measure because the longer this clause, the lower its strength, especially from a unit propagation uh, viewpoint because we need to have many uh, fals literals falsified before the constraint propagates something. But this is not the case actually uh, for PB constraints because as I said, we may have many literals, but one that is propagated immediately at, without making any assignment. So uh, the size does not reflect its propagation power. And uh, this is because actually the size of PB constraints also takes into account the coefficients that appear in this uh, constraints. So here, for instance, we have that uh, there are different coefficients uh, so we need to take them into account and they may also become very big also. So this is uh, another um, point to be uh, considered because if coefficients become very big, we need to use arbitrary precision encodings instead of uh, fixed precision encodings. And the, we need to perform more complicated arithmetic operations because they are not executed directly by the processor, but we need uh, algorithms to perform these operations. So we also do not want to have a coefficients with big coefficients. So a possibility is to consider a constraint with big coefficients of bad quality. And to this end, uh, we may consider, for instance, the degree of the constraint. So here, for instance, it's seven, because uh, since we have the saturation rule, we can know that the degree of uh, the constraint is an upper bound of the coefficients in the constraint. So with the, only the degree, we can evaluate the size of the coefficient in the, uh, in the constraints. And we can either consider the U as a quality measure or the size in terms of number of bits required to represent it to measure the quality of the constraint. We can also uh, uh, generalize the LBD measure uh, of uh, clauses to uh, PB constraints. Uh, so here, the idea is to consider uh, the number of decision levels that appear in a clause. The problem is that uh, in, uh, if we look at this constraint, for instance, there, are, there is a literal that is unassigned. So what is the decision level? So we need to, to take this into account to define an LBD measure for uh, PB constraints. And also there are satisfied literals 
whereas in when we consider LBD, we measure the we either measure it on the conflicting constraint or constraints that propagate, depending on whether the constraint is learned or uh, is used as a reason again. And in this case, there is only um, one literal that is uh, so at most one literal that is satisfied, which is the one that is propagated. And if it is propagated, it means also that uh, there is a falsified literal at the same decision level in this constraint. So we need to take this into account in some way. And there are uh, many different, so they, uh, it should be five here because I, I did uh, one more uh, after this. So uh, the different uh, LBD measures, maybe the LBD computed over assigned literals. So we do not uh, take into account the literals that are unassigned because there is no decision level for such literals. The LBD S measure, uh, it works similarly, but in, instead of ignoring an assigned literals, we say that, okay, these literals are assigned at some decision level that does not exist, but we consider this as a same decision level for all uh, literals. The LBDD for different, yes, it's, uh, we consider uh, that all unassigned literals are assigned at a different decision level. So we count all unassigned literals and we add this to the LBDA. And then we compute either the LBD over falsified literals or over effective literals to take into account um, the fact that these literals are most, um, more involved in the conflict or the propagation. So with this uh, new uh, strategy, so uh, the new definitions of LBD for PB constraint and the quality measures based on the size of coefficients, we can define uh, new uh, deletion strategies for uh, learned constraints. Uh, because uh, as for set solvers, PB, PB solvers must uh, delete constraint, but this is not uh, as needed, let's say, as um, for SAT solvers, at least in SAT 4J, because uh, cutting plane based insurance is much, is much slower than uh, resolution inference. So the solver, in a sense, learns less constraints, but they are, as a, since one constraint is equivalent to many clauses in general, this kind of uh, compensates the fact that we learn few constraints. But since we learn a few constraints, we do not, uh, there is less. Um, impact of many constraints on the uh, efficiency of the solver. Uh, but still, we implement uh, the land constraint deletion to uh, based on the uh, different quality measures I presented uh, before. So based on the different LBD measures and the, uh, the degree of uh, the constraint. And we also use the quality measures as uh, a restart policy based on uh, the adaptive restart proposed in glucose, which evaluates the quality of the recently learned constraints. So here, uh, if the constraints uh, that are learned more recently are of poor quality compared of all the other constraints that have been learned, then we, we perform a restart. And once again, we use the different quality measures to uh, trigger restarts here. So we can see that for deletion, there is not a big impact. Uh, still, uh, it's uh, all are better than the default, but to a little extent. And quite interestingly, uh, doing no deletion at all is uh, better than uh, deleting based on the activity of the constraint as in Minisat, uh, which is a default uh, uh, approach in Sat4j. Question. So we can see, yes. Yeah. Do you, how aggressively are you erasing constraints? Are you using like the glucose settings for this? Yeah. Yes, I think. Uh, yes, so th this is the same algorithm as in uh, Minisat. So you just uh, uh, remove half of the non-blocked uh, constraints. From the front. So, so minus I think glucose are different in this regard. So, yeah, but uh, so um, we 
Uh, so I can cut to uh, just to the, the why I'm asking is like if so so the, the way glucose does it roughly give or take like after uh, after n conflicts glucose will have something like square root n constraints left in the in the clause database that's like the rough scaling um, glossing over some details uh, now if actually not deleting clauses at all might be competitive. Then this sort of raises the question, well, you could interpolate between aggressive deletion and less aggressive deletion. So maybe there's a, like a curve hiding there that will go much further to the right. But, but this, I guess, this would be a topic for further future exploration. So uh, here is for the deletion strategies. So as we can see, few impact, at least in set 4 j uh, well, little impact uh, in set 4 j uh, for these experiments. For restart, we have also something similar. And quite interestingly, the, the PicoSat restarts uh, perform quite well, which are um, the static PicoSat uh, uh, restart policy with uh, inner and outer restarts, which is quite competitive compared to all the other, even the LBD based implemented in Z4J. And uh, still, the, the size here uh, seems to matter for uh, having a good uh, performance with restarts. And if we combine uh, restart and deletion, since we use the same uh, quality measure, we have that um, the degrees the degrees remain uh, performance here, and uh, the activity based. So here are the static restart policies, which are uh, which are combined with default activity uh, quality measures, and these are uh, not so uh, competitive compared to the other. But this this may be due to the fact that the activity-based restart policy is not uh, really performance on uh, the benchmarks here. But still we can see that the VBS is quite far from uh, uh, all of these strategies. And this, is, this was also the case for the restart policy. So once again, there might be uh, room for improvement here maybe based on uh, automatic configuration algorithms, for instance. And uh, so uh, with all this, um, these strategies, we have uh, combined all of them since they can be uh, combined uh, and uh, they are independent in some way. We uh, to try to get the best. And if we combine all of them in a set for j, we can see that we improve uh, the solver uh, and especially the fact that the, the variant of the bump strategies is the one with the biggest impact on, uh, on the solver. And uh, combining uh, this strategy with the other allows to improve the solver, but not enough to reach the VBS. So we, um, there is some, once again, some room for improvements here. And we need to try to identify what are also the interactions between these heuristics since they are still tightly linked in the solver. So maybe there may be also interactions that we have not taken into account that may also explain why uh, we are not, uh, we do not reach the VBS here. So here is uh, once again the plot uh, that compares that with other server. And this time there is also uh, all uh, pseudo Boolean solvers of the latest uh, competition in uh, 2016. So, and here we can see that uh, Z4J is quite competitive now uh, with all these strategies compared to all the state of the art solvers but still uh, quite far from uh, the first version of France that year. And it may be interesting to see whether uh, we can uh, improve the performance of rounding set with the different uh, strategies uh, presented here in Sat4j. So before uh, letting Daniel speak uh, about uh, this point uh, as an answer to uh, Jacob to Jacob's talk on the bootcamp uh, week, uh, maybe I will take some questions if there are some. Uh, 
So there is some chat activity going on, which I will read out. So it looks like, so, so there are two differences from that you could have from, from with, with regard to minisat and glucose when it comes to constraint deletion. But it seems like the number of constraints that are kept is roughly as in glucose. It should be squaring like square root n. But, but Daniel points out that the selection has been done on activity and not on LBD based measures. I hope we got this right. Yeah, uh, so th there are many different strategies in uh, uh, lamb deletion for strategies in SAT4J. And uh, so for, for us, it's a glucose if it's based on LBD. And uh, uh, then do we have inherited the, the other one from activity from Minisat. So I don't think, uh, I don't remember that. I mean, this has been more than 12 years ago, but. Uh, uh, I think this is really the, the classical activity uh, relation of minister that we have for the. So I think the very I, I shouldn't. It's very dangerous to answer Daniel when it comes to like you know sat solving. I'll I'll make a fool out of myself immediately, uh, but I'll try anyway. So I, I think in the, like some very early versions of Minisat, you could, the, the question is, how do you decide when is the next time you're going to do a database cleaning? And yeah, if, well, instead I... of, in, if instead of doing an additive increase, you would increase the, the time limit by say multiplying by you know, 1.25 or something so that your database pruning becomes more and more infrequent, that would actually lead to a linear scaling so that now after, after n conflicts, you have uh, like theta of n uh, constraints in your database. Uh, and then you can play with the multiplicative factor to decide you know, what, what, uh, what the linear factor is. But this might be worth exploring, especially if it seems like, I mean, if, if not erasing at all is competitive, then this might be worth exploring. Like you would clear out the bad constraints, but you'd keep much more around and maybe that would be helpful. Yeah, yeah. Well, we, we have many different ones because we we even have a... Uh, so typically we have, we have what, what we call a timer that will just uh, look at uh, how much memory you have or other things. So, well, we, we, can, we can check and we can discuss this, uh, no problem. Uh, should any, I talk about any other questions or? Yeah, that's what I wanted. So I don't see anything in the chat. Let me just check. Okay, maybe we should talk about uh, recovering cardinality constraints. That sounds exciting. Why don't we do that? <laughs> exciting, I don't know. So, uh, Omar, next slide. Um, okay, so one of the of, of the issue actually we we have uh, with uh, well we set for J and with many other uh, systems is that if you just uh, uh, try to solve uh, let's say the prison all on on a CNF it will just not work and um, and so th th this is really. A Painful because even people uh, trying to, to play with story example will probably um, find the, the closer representation. And so th th there is that issue that, okay, we, we need to, it would be nice uh, because uh, uh, a human can do it, that uh, a solver can just uh, figure out from the CNF uh, how to, to prove uh, efficiently uh, uh, the thing. Uh, so, uh, so if we go back to the first example that Roman showed you about um, the, what we call the human proof for, for pigeon hole, um, actually what you, you see that now you do not have really the kinetic constraints. What you have is a, cl a closer representation of the kinetic constraints. So for, for, for the kinetic constraints, uh, P11 plus P21 plus uh, P31 less or equal to one, actually you have three clauses. Uh, for A, for B, uh, for C, and so what is really uh, so what is really the input you should be uh, you should be able to deal with should be those clauses, and actually the first step uh, you you have to do uh, with those clauses is to sum up uh, 
the, the three uh, clauses to get uh, a pseudo-boolean constraint. And that pseudo-boolean constraint will get uh, two literals uh, for P11, for P21, or for P31. And from this uh, pseudo-boolean constraints, you can just divide them uh, by two, and then you will recover your uh, cardinality constraints. So here, um, we should, so th they are written uh, greater or equal to two, but this is exactly the same thing of the negating all the literals and uh, strict uh, uh, less or, or at most one. Okay, and uh, and then you can continue uh, with uh, the with the proof, and then you get uh, your contradiction. So really, the, the issue is how is it possible? Uh, well, is it possible in the SAT solver to 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 find out how to uh, sum up some of the clauses and then uh, how to apply the division because here uh, it works because on the left hand side, all the literals uh, do have the same coefficient and you are, you are going to, um, uh, from the, you are going to round up the degree divided by, by two, which will which, which get you two. And this is how you, you, you get your, um, your cardinality constraints. And actually, uh, so uh, we've been discussing about this uh, with uh, Jacob when I was visiting him. And, um, and so I, I came back uh, uh, to Lens and then we, we started working uh, on this. So, um, and uh, maybe next slide, Omar. And uh, so just to give you an example, uh, uh, so this is with Sat4j. If you take a, a pigeon or problem with 100, uh, pig, uh, 100 one pigeons and 100 holes, so it will be uh, not possible to, to solve it if you take uh, um, any version of SAT4J, either generalized resolution of based on resolution. But if you input, if your input is, cardin, uh, is made of cardinality constraints, then uh, the system based on a resolution will work. And so, well, I mean, if you think about uh, constraint programming, they will tell you, well, uh, constraints matter. So th your input should be uh, the input uh, which, which pre uh, preserve as much structure as possible, as much information as possible. On the other hand, uh, we have our colleagues from theoretical complexity and saying, well, but uh, if you want to play with proof system, uh, we should have the same uh, input. So. Uh, so the idea was, to, okay, can we find a way, um, well, to, to re recover, uh, to retrieve the scanality constraints in the solver, but definitely not in the way a human will do it. And uh, the idea was to, to, to work uh, on this uh, and to, to do it uh, as a pre-processing step. Next slide. So the, the, the thing is, yeah, well, I mean, uh, so we have uh, several, uh, one of the issue we have is, so we show, uh, I show you one, uh, what we call the pairwise encoding uh, in, in, in the example, but there are actually many different ways to uh, encode cardinality constraints. It depends uh, of the degree, depends if it's an equality or if it's uh, on at most or, uh, or at least, and uh, so the many different people have been working on many different encodings, which have different uh, strengths depending on what you want in terms of number of variables, in number of uh, clauses, in uh, uh, maintaining or not uh, a consistency, and so on. And so the, the issue here is if you want to do a, to recover your your cardinality constraints from the CNF, in some ways you would have to be able to uh, recognize all those encodings and new ones. And, and this is this is not, well, this will hardly not working. So the, the, the approach was, okay, there is something we do in, uh, in SAT that we do often, it's unit propagation. And so the, the, the point is to try to um, uh, use unit propagation to try to recover uh, uh, the cardinality constraints. And uh, th the nice thing is that it, in principle, uh, it, should weigh, it should work for any encoding preserving at consistency. And this is the, the, the nice property. Well, this is in principle because at some point there is a combinatorial uh, 
problem to and uh, so we, we have limitation and uh, so th this was a, a work we we done uh, with uh, Armin uh, with Norbert and uh, with Emmanuel and uh, more recently uh, Jacob and Jan uh, work on the uh, uh, well let's say dynamic in processing detection uh, uh, so the, the, the our in, in our case what we want to do is recover all the kinetic constraints and then apply CDCM. Oh, well, uh, apply uh, general resolution. The, what uh, Jan and Jakob have done is that they, they integrated the detection on the fly, which means that they, they may not have to recover everything to be able to solve uh, the problem. So those are two different approaches. So uh, let's see how it works. So there is um, a, a nice property uh, actually, if you think about um, what is a clause, so this is what I mentioned earlier. If you have a, a clause uh, x1 or x2 or xn, actually what it means, it means that this is a, an at most n minus one uh, constraints where all the literals are negated. And if you think about this, what we are, want to achieve is from uh, that kind of uh, at most uh, k constraints, we want to be able to recover uh, literals m1 to mp such that you get a, a, a more informative, a, a stronger uh, at most constraints. And on to detect m1 to mp, we are going to use uh, unit propagation. So we can show, see that uh, in one uh, example. So what we want to do, we have a, a, a small formula on the left uh, so th those are only binary clauses, and what we want to do is to recover x1 plus x2 plus x3 uh, less or equal to 1. So let's see uh, how we, to, we are going to do this. So let's uh, first consider the first uh, clause. Uh, this is minus 1 or uh, not my, uh, uh, so not x1 or not x2. So this is actually equivalent to uh, x1 plus x2 less or equal to 1. Uh, and so from, from this, uh, we, what we want to achieve is to, do, to perform unit propagation and uh, to be able to uh, see what happens if we propagate uh, x1 and what happens if we propagate x2. So there is a small animation. Uh, so, the, so here we have x plus 1, uh, x1 plus x2 uh, less or equal to 1. Now, uh, next one, we have the, we try to propagate uh, x1. So x1 propagate not x2, uh, propagate not x4, uh, not x4 propagate not x3, uh, and we are done. Uh, so we, we the, the, the unit propagation of uh, x1 propagates uh, x1 and not x2, not x3, not x4. So we do the same thing for x2. And so with x2, we are going to propagate not x1. Uh, uh, x2 will propagate not x5, not x5 will propagate not x3. Uh, so what we will get if we take the intersection of uh, x1 uh, and x2, we will have not x3. So it means that we can add in our um, uh, constraints x1 plus x2, we can add uh, x3 uh, to our uh, at most one constraint. And uh, that will uh, allow you to, uh, allow us to uh, to retrieve a kinetic constraint of size three instead of uh, two. And uh, actually, we can try to propagate uh, what happens. So, uh, and, and this process will terminate because if I try to propagate x one, x two, and x three, uh, there will be no more intersection, and uh, the the process uh, uh, stops. And so this is. Um, uh, so the, uh, on the next slide, we have uh, the algorithm and we would see that uh, the, the idea is simple. So you pick any uh, clause that you, so a clause of type uh, um, K plus one will uh, uh, gives you um, uh, a kinetic constraint at most K. And from that, you try to uh, uh, recover um, literals that will uh, allow you to uh, increase the size of your atmosphere uh, constraints 
So the, the main issue here, so it's not a big deal if K is one, okay? But uh, when K is increasing, you will have to uh, compute all subsets of your literals uh, of size K. And uh, that, that is uh, actually the, the, the issue with the approach uh, because you, you have to, to generate they, them, uh, do the unit propagation and compute the intersection. Uh, and then you, you can do this uh, until the, uh, uh, the intersection is empty. So we, we can see some uh, examples uh, of the experiment. So in that case, we, so Amin had a, a syntactic uh, detection uh, for Admos 1 uh, in Mingering. And then uh, Norbert has uh, the implementation of both uh, syntactic recognition and uh, the proposed uh, Un, uh, we, what we call it semantic one, based on unit propagation. And uh, in that case, we feed SAT4J with a generalized resolution uh, on them. And we compare that with SAT4J without preprocessing. And uh, SBSAT has also uh, some uh, uh, detection of kinetic constraint uh, in that case. And this is with a 900 uh, seconds timeout. So if you, we look at the table of results, you will see that, so we have 14 instances uh, of these pigeon node problems with uh, uh, six different encodings. And so Lingeling uh, finds, uh, and is faster to, uh, to find the, the pairwise one, uh, because this is the syntactic, uh, syntactic detection. Uh, so RIS with the syntactical uh, detection could also uh, provide uh, to set for J uh, enough kinetic constraint to solve some of the sequential or on product encodings, and uh, almost the case for for pairwise. Uh, and then the um, the approach with uh, the semantical uh, encoding uh, allows to solve uh, a few, many of the uh, encodings, but not all. So um, uh, and uh, for uh, SBSAT had the, the best uh, result on the, uh, on the ladder encoding process. And you see that if you look at SAT4J without uh, any preprocessing, I mean, it, it solved uh, one or, or two benchmarks. So this is really ridiculous. Uh, and so all the, so, uh, the time for SAT4J to solve the, the, the benchmarks should be uh, uh, nothing because the, the, it's really the, the time of the preprocessing if you have all the, the kinetic constraints. So this is our, on the, the pigeon principles. We, we have also other uh, examples of uh, benchmarks with many uh, kinetic constraints. So, uh, so those are called uh, balance block design. And those, those were really in uh, the set competition on the crafted category, the very hard uh, benchmarks. But actually they, they are just about counting. So if you, retrieve the, uh, can, the, the kinetic constraints. They are just uh, very easy to solve. And uh, actually you, you see that on all those cases, um, SAT4J uh, was, the, was able to solve them uh, either using the uh, syntactical or the semantical uh, recognition because those are only uh, at most two, at most three uh, constraints. And uh, the, the last case is uh, uh, the so-called uh, challenging problem on the next slide, um, where we, uh, so the, the, the challenge uh, benchmarks is uh, from uh, Alan Van Gelder and Eva Spence was um, a, a case uh, in which you, you have to, uh, it takes, you, you could run a clasp at that time which was the, the, the best solver on crafted benchmarks. You can run it during 44 hours. It would not solve it. But if you retrieve all the constraints um, with SAT4J, uh, if you recover it using the semantic uh, approach, you will get at most three constraints and you, you can solve it uh, within a second. And I just did it uh, uh, on my computer, even with the pure Java approach, because you, you notice that the implementation of the preprocessor was done um, in C++ by, by Norbert. And just to check how many of the constraints we could recover. So we took some Sudoku grids. Uh, so you, you have typically many different constraints because you have the rows, the columns, the uh, cubes, uh, 
And um, typically, uh, the approach uh, takes uh, um, recover almost all the constraints uh, uh, if you use the syntactic ones and uh, the semantic web takes all of them. So this is sort of a very um, uh, well. It works well because uh, here we have uh, a small k. So the issue being that it's generic, but we have uh, the issue that in practice it only works uh, if you have uh, if you need to recover um, uh, constraints with a small k. And so if it if he doesn't recognize the encodings, you will just get a, a bunch of different uh, constraints with a few uh, with few literals. I think I am done, uh, Omar. Okay, so uh, maybe uh, unless there are some questions for Daniel, I will continue with some open question about pseudo Boolean conflict analysis. Yeah, sounds good. I think let's continue. Okay. So I, I want I would like to present two in, interesting questions about pseudo Boolean conflict analysis. So first, it, uh, the first question is about improving the back jump level uh, at which the back jump is uh, performed uh, after the conflict analysis in a pseudo Boolean solver. So the idea is uh, to follow the classical set uh, approach and say, okay, when I found uh, once I found uh, constraints that propagate something, then I learn this constraint that I propagate. So as I said uh, earlier, at the first um, level at which the constraint uh, propagates something. But actually, the, uh, this approach, which is uh, the uh, equivalent to the, which is the first UIP uh, approach uh, used in set solvers, is not always optimal in PB solvers. So let's consider this example. So it's quite a hard example because uh, to see really what happens, we need to have a quite big constraints. So basically here we have two constraints and we want uh, to, uh, do. so the, this first constraint here is conflicting. And this constraint here has propagated at decision level four, these three literals here. So we perform a conflict uh, analysis and we cancel uh, the two literal f and j out uh, by, uh, so, uh, on, uh, by adding these two constraints and we get this constraint here. And actually this constraint is assertive. Uh, sorry, this constraint is assertive and uh, we can just stop here and uh, I think it's, it propagates uh, B at decision level two, if I don't say a mistake. Um, but the, the important fact here is that if we continue the conflict analysis here and we say, okay, I can continue and I will uh, eliminate the, uh, some literal, so uh, one of C, D or J, uh, depending on uh, the order of the propagations. And actually these three literals will be uh, canceled out by the cancellation rule. And we get this constraint here, which this time propagates B at decision level one. So we have improved the back jump level by continuing to perform conflict analysis. So this shows that the first UIP is not optimal here. And intuitively, the idea is that uh, in the case of uh, clauses, the first UIP is optimal because when, uh, if we continue to perform resolutions, we will only add uh, decision levels and uh, this will not uh, change uh, the bank jump level. Or, or if it, uh, sorry, if we change it, it can only uh, become deeper in the search tree because uh, the, the literal with the, which has the decision level at which to back jump will remain in the, in the close. But here, this is not the case because of the coefficients that may uh, 
so, so, so the idea is that if we add uh, new literals, it does not mean it will decrease, it will uh, make the Bayesian level deeper because of the coefficient. Maybe this will not have enough impact to uh, make the bank jump uh, level uh, less interesting. But the problem is that, uh, of course, in some cases, the bank jump level will become uh, not uh, will, um, well, in general, the bank jump level, we do not know in advance whether uh, performing the cancellation here will improve the bank jump level or uh, worsen it. So it would be interesting to know uh, uh, when to stop, actually. So because the uh, algorithm I presented earlier is not always optimal, so we need to find a way to improve it. And currently, there is no real um, solution and uh, because we need to know when to stop. And uh, really, uh, if it will, if in two sense, the first one is, whether um, we will improve the back jump level and whether we will not break on, uh, on the other of invariance. So for instance, if we back jump too high and we, uh, no, no, not if we back jump, but if we continue the conflict analysis too high, maybe we can lose the assertion, uh, the concept will not be assertive anymore and it will never be possible. So the, uh, to uh, make it assertive again. And this is something we tried at some point, we tried, okay, so if we continue, but so in some cases, the, uh, the constraint is not assertive anymore and it will not become assertive again. So there is no possible no way. Bayesian. So that, yes. I mean, you could always run the decision learning scheme, no? Like yes. Just as in CDCL, uh, you should always be able to just run the full decision scheme all the way to the top. And worst case, like you get a clause that is assertive. So I don't see that you would ever lose assertiveness. Uh, Maybe we should take it offline. Yes, maybe. Uh, this was this was really a first uh, first try. So uh, we just tried to continue, and at some point the the, the, close, the constraint was not assertive. So uh, we this is really think, an open question it, at this point. Yeah, I think you can get it back. But it's it's like again, it's it's worth driving home the, the difference from CDCL because like one of the nice things with first UIP learned constraints is that you know provably that among all the constraints that you will ever see, regardless of you know whether you do recursive clause minimization later or something, the first UIP is the one that will cause the the longest back jump. Guaranteed, 100%, provably. Like for, for pseudo Boolean solvers, that's actually false. You can improve your back jump, or you can even like, uh, you can even maybe derive contradiction in one shot if you keep doing your conflict analysis beyond the first UIP point. Yes, indeed. And actually, this is the case for a pigeon principle formula. Exactly. Uh, so um, this was actually the first example we had uh, on this. Okay, and the second question is about improving uh, conflict detection. So here, for instance, oh, so there's a have... there's a good question oh. actually. So, uh, oh, yes. so how how do we how how is back jump level computed? How do you compute the back jump level? Ah, uh, so uh, first we need to know whether the constraint is assertive. So we just try to see uh, whether uh, the constraint propagates something at uh, the lowest decision level. Um, meaning uh, without considering the current one, just uh, be, the one before. And to compute the back jump level, we, are, we look at uh, the different decision levels at which the, uh, there are falsified later in the constraint, and we check whether it propagates something. So basically this is done with the slack, so which is uh, the sum of the coefficients of uh, non-falsified literals minus the degree. And if at the at a given decision level, the, the slack is lower than a coefficient of a literal in the constraint, then uh, the constraint propagates this literal. So, and uh, because uh, the constraint may propagate literals at different decision level, we need to check uh, whether uh, we have this property uh, of the slack 
uh, at each decision level, uh, at, at least at the beginning, the idea is to make it, check it at each decision level appearing in the constraint. But since we know that propagations are only triggered by uh, falsified intervals, we can only uh, check this for decision level at which there is a, a falsified interval in the constraint. Does it and answer the question? Uh, the, a follow-up question. Your constraint might propagate something at some higher level, but the propagated literal is not relevant for the conflict. Would you take this into account when back jumping? Oh, uh, I'm not sure to see the, this. Uh... Well, I think one thing that can, weird thing that can happen is that you can actually propagate something to the same value, right? But you could propagate it earlier well, than mean, before. If you propagate something, then the literal is relevant. Uh, so, uh, another uh, good question in the chat, but let's do this one first. Yeah. So, so what did you want to say, Daniel? Uh, no, I mean, uh, well, I mean, it, it depends. So um, the, if, if the literal is propagated, then it is relevant, okay? Uh, because it means uh, it, 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 we, if at some point we have to propagate it, it is relevant for the constraint. Uh, but, but I think, uh, yeah. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not relevant in terms of uh, general relevance. It is uh, in the sense of uh, for the conflict. It is useful for the conflict. I, I think it is the sense of the question. Okay. But th this also raises a question that I, I think it's worth driving home this point that another difference from CDCL, which we already said, but if so, let's say it again. So you can actually get the a situation where a constraint is propagating at a number of different levels. So you get a choice whether you want to back jump, you know, a few levels or some medium amount of levels, or you want to back jump very far because the constraint is asserting at several levels. How would you choose? No, you need to, to do it at the first level where it is asserted. You will yeah. the, you will pick the, the like the the nearest to the conflict where it is asserted. No, the the, the, high, the, the farthest the, away. Yeah, the, the farthest away. The, the first time it, it becomes assertive, else it breaks your solver invariant, at least the, 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 the classical CDCL invariant, because you- It breaks the CDCL invariant, but actually rounding set would not do this. It, it will like, it will just, it will do the shortest possible back jump, I think. Um, yeah. So- Closest to the root, yes, yes, yes. Uh, oh no, I like the closest to the conflict. Yeah. Uh, do you have assignment levels different? No, I mean we have the same. Uh, so we, we are still in the in, in the old-fashioned CDCL. It means that uh, so the, the idea is because you 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 learn in a new clause. One of the invariant from uh, CDCL is that as soon as you have something that can propagate it, uh, you you propagate it. So to, to be in a in a state where you, you have to go back to a state uh, as if your Children constraint was uh, would propagate if it was there for the beginning. So this is the reason why you have to propagate it from the uh, uh, highest to the root. Uh, so again, I don't think we do this actually. So I think what Armin is looking for is in some sense correct that it this is somewhat similar to the situation with chronological backtracking. Yeah. I think in general, at least the way rounding set is, is coded up, unless no, one of the yeah. members of my group changed it since last time I under, under, understood how this works. Um, rounding set will, it, it will be in general possible that you have something on the trail that has a correct reason, but if you started from the top, then it would propagate at an earlier level now, but you don't know this because you didn't back jump that far. That is a situation that you can have at least in rounding set. Yeah, no, but I, I know I mean it's correct that if you do currently call backtracking, you have different uh, uh, data structures and uh, it will work differently. But set for yeah. day is still old fashioned, and for this, you need to go back to the first to the first decision level, the, the smallest, the, the closest to the root. Uh, the first time the, the constraint propagates, you you have to go 
at that level and propagate at that level. Okay. Then another, uh, yeah. So another question was from, I'm looking for it now, from Paul Beam. So the, the combinations, uh, these combinations during conflict analysis, presumably, have been chosen as syntactic combinations of two constraints. Is there a geometric way to understand the highest level inferred from a pair of conflicting constraints? I guess the highest level at which something inferred from a pair of constraints would be propagating. Is that the way to read the question, Paul? Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, no, we, we, for, for us, it's really um, driven by, by the invariants of, of CDCL. It's just that you need to maintain the fact that you are going to propagate as soon uh, as uh, propagation is detected and uh, for this, you need to go back to the, the, the highest level in which uh, it propagates. Um, yeah, maybe the, the, the problem is that if you do it another way, unless you use some uh, Techniques from chronological CDCL, I mean, it will just break the solver. Because the, so the, the solver expects that everything that has been propagated at some point has been done. So if you do not maintain that, it, it will just not work. I, I, think, I think everything would still work actually. So um, maybe so, we should take that offline. Stefan, yes. Well, one comment about this. Um, I, I think the thing is, it's true that you lose propagation guarantees on your learned constraints. So it might be that your learned constraint would have propagated something. However, your um, existing constraints in the database will never be violated oh, with yes. respect to propagation, which is in contrast to doing non chronological backtracking where I think also original constraints can be violated. And this yeah. is why it will kind of, it will still produce the right result because all original constraints are always propagated right. Also some learned constraints will miss propagations. Yeah, but uh, well, in some ways you do not really want to do, to make any difference between learned constraints and, uh, uh, and original constraints, right? Well, even if you can remove some learned constraints, but. Um, well, well. So, so I think one reason why this works is getting a bit technical. It's like, so, so what goes wrong when you do chronological backtracking in CDCL? One thing, weird thing that can happen is that you don't have, you can like crash through a decision level because suddenly you thought you had, um, like you were looking for a first UIP, but suddenly all literals at the last decision levels are somehow gone. And this is because your trail was out of order. Okay, and, and so if you want to do chronological backtracking, you have to extend CDCL to deal with this. But in pseudo-Boolean solving, we have to deal with this anyway, because even if your trail is perfectly kosher and in order, it can still happen that you get cancellations so that suddenly you have nothing at the last decision level. Yeah, and sure. then you're like, you're looking at it on the conflict side and like you lost your first UIP constraint, what should I do? Well, the answer is just go continue to the next level. So in some sense, like the extra code you need to deal with chronological backtracking since in CDCL, you already have it there in pseudo Boolean solving because you you need to deal with that case anyway. That's sort of how I view it. Uh, regarding whether you could somehow get to the highest uh, backjump level by some geometric idea, I mean, in some sense, I guess it's like the, it's the, in some sense, I guess it's the least number it's the smallest partial assignment for which the LP, the linear program is still infeasible in some sense. So I guess you could like maybe talk to an LP solver and get something. The question is like the LP solver will take a long time to get back to you with the answer. But definitely there's like, you, you could think about, in, in, it's, this is a general question, like given a trail and given a conflict, could you do something more intelligent than this like trivial cutting planes derivation that we have? I think that's a great question. That is somehow hidden inside Paul Beam's question as I read it. Okay, sorry for interrupting. Okay, so as a, 
The next question I would like to present is about uh, conflict detection in general. So here we have a set of constants that are the current partial assignment. And we have actually two conflicts that occur simultaneously. So key two is conflicting and key four is also conflicting. So at some point the solver has to choose one conflict on which to, um, to perform the analysis. And actually, we can, so if we use key four, we get this constraint here. But something which is quite uh, uh, weird is that if we instead, uh, well, I need to check some. Okay, no. Here, there is something which is quite weird because actually here, so uh, at this step, we want to uh, perform a uh, cancellation between this constraint, which is derived uh, be, uh, with uh, key four and key three, and um, and uh, so we want to uh, cancel out the literal uh, not D. And actually, the reason for not D is uh, key two, and uh, which is uh, quite strange is that key two is also conflicting. So we, this is also a broken invariant from a, a CDCL, which is that we have conflictual reasons. And this is because actually uh, we, we know that a constraint may propagate a little wall and then still become conflicting. And this depending on the order of the propagations, we can just have um, conflictual reasons. So there is a way to not have conflictual reason here which is actually to choose key two as a conflict, but we need somehow to know that we need to choose key two. So here there are quite two questions in one, which is, uh, sorry, uh, we, how to choose the conflict uh, in this case. And if we have a conflictual reason, what do we do with this, uh, with this conflictual reason? There are two, uh, uh, first ID that may come, which are, uh, we just continue the constellation as if the reason was not conflictual. Or we can uh, just say, okay, I have a conflictual reason. So maybe I just stop analyzing the, the conflict I had and I use this conflict instead. And there are probably other, uh, other possibilities that we, I, we don't think about for the moment. But the, still, we, we need to know that uh, this may happen. And actually, in this case, well, the two constraints we had, so this one here and this one, are not comparable. So there is no clear uh, best way to choose a conflict. But intuitively, it's as if, um, if we have a conflictual reason, it's as if we did not choose uh, the, we did not select the earliest conflict in some sense. So this is really a, it's an, an open question once again on this point that I wanted to, to present here. And uh, to, as the last part of uh, this presentation, I would like to discuss about the normalized forms that I presented at the very beginning of this talk. Uh, which are this form. So here we, we chose to have normalized form uh, with uh, uh, an at least operator. And uh, so the first question is why do we need the normalized form? So basically we need to have normalized form because when we apply the cancellation rule, we need to have little walls on the same side of the relational operator. So this is intuitively what why we need to have the same uh, relational operator on all constraints, so as to be able to uh, linearly combine the constraints. But this does not prevent us from using an at most operator. So why do we not use it? So typically, this is because if we want to represent clauses, it's quite easy. We just need to have uh, an at least one constraint. So, if we have clauses that are represented natively, we can use 
many of the data structures that are, that are designed in CN, for CNF formula in uh, SAT solvers, such as, for instance, the watch literal scheme. And if instead we use the, uh, the Atmos operator, then we can also have a two watch scheme, but this time, instead of uh, uh, updating watch literals when literals get falsified, we need to update them when they get satisfied. So this kind of change the, the hours algorithm work at this, uh, at this level in the solver. But the problem with uh, uh, the at least operator is that it is not always practical to have this, uh, this representation. For instance, if we consider a optimization problem. So an optimization problem, you have an objective function and we want to minimize a weighted sum of little walls under the constraint of the problem. So let, uh, so the optimization uh, algorithm works as follows in the, in uh, PB uh, solvers. So first we run the solver and it will find a model which uh, assigns a certain value to the literals of the objective function. And so there is a value for this objective function that is computed based on this model. And to improve this model, we just say, okay, uh, uh, now I want to have uh, an objective function that has a smaller value. So we just add this constraint to the solver and uh, okay, uh, to say we want to minimize. And if we normalize it, so here it should be uh, an at least here. So we need to uh, compute the sum of all coefficients here. But uh, if we do so, and if the coefficients are uh, uh, quite big, then the degree of the constant will be also uh, big. Even if the value uh, of the objective function is small, since uh, here we, the sum may be very big. So here, uh, the problem is that as we use the saturation rule to have an upper bound of uh, the coefficient, then if the degree is very big, in some sense, the saturation rule will be less uh, uh, applicable so that we cannot decrease uh, much the size of the coefficients when constraints uh, are combined. So this may lead the coefficients to grow uh, during the constellation step used in uh, uh, applied during conflict analysis. So maybe it would be interesting to keep the uh, natural uh, at most representation in uh, at least in this case uh, to uh, represent the constraint. But uh, the problem is that, uh, as I said, we have the saturation rule, uh, but it is not applicable to uh, um, uh, at most uh, constraints. So we need to find another rule to replace it in solvers. And actually there is uh, a rule that is used uh, as a preprocessing in uh, mixed integer programming solvers, which is this one, which uh, can be used uh, instead of the saturation rule when we have uh, at most uh, constraints. And here we, we need, so uh, in this rule, we need to update both uh, the coefficient of, uh, of uh, the literal and the degree, which is uh, by a value which is computed based on the coefficients of the other literals. So it may be uh, a little harder to understand and uh, maybe to compute uh, than saturation, but we, with this rule, we can uh, replace the saturation rule and deal with uh, at most uh, constraints. So if I recap briefly what I said on normalized constraints, so we need normalized constraints to apply the cancellation rule. So we need to have to choose uh, either to use at most or at least as a relational operator. The at least operator is useful to represent clauses. But sometimes we, we would prefer to use an at most operator, for instance, an optimization problem, 
And we need to adapt again the proof system if instead of uh, using at least uh, constraint, we use at most constraint, for instance, using the, the rule I presented in the slide before. And ideally, it would be interesting to have a way to represent both uh, normalized forms with at most and at least, and to apply the operation on which is on the representation that seems better, as this is done, for instance, for SAT encodings of, uh, of pseudo Boolean constraints. So now uh, I will conclude. So uh, first, a uh, brief recap of what I presented in this talk. So um, current implementation of cutting planes proof system in PB solver are not fully satisfactory as we cannot exploit uh, in, PB in, actual, in current PB solver its full strength. So for instance, uh, we need, if we want to derive a cardinality constraint, we need to add additional steps uh, that are not taken into account during the conflict analysis or at some other points to, and, uh, to derive uh, PB constraints in general from uh, clauses. And also we, I, sh I presented that irrelevant little all may be introduced during conflict analysis uh, when uh, combining uh, constraints and this literal, irrelevant literal way then become artificially relevant may lead to the inference of weaker constraints. And two, uh, as a countermeasure, we can apply the weakening rule and ineffective literals, but this is a really aggressive countermeasure that only derives causes. So we need, we, it would be interesting to have uh, something uh, less aggressive. And the best weakening strategy that uh, we have in set for j currently is the application of the partial weakening rule followed by a division step. And also I presented a complementary heuristic implemented in CDCL PB solvers, in a, which are um, which can be better adapted from the set uh, definitions to uh, better take into account the properties of PB constraints and to improve the performance uh, in the in SAT4J, uh, at least in this talk. As perspectives, uh, it would be interesting to find other strategies uh, for applying a uh, cutting planes uh, rule to exploit more power. So for instance, uh, the addition rule that may, be, that may allow to uh, derive general PB constraints from uh, clauses. And also, we may uh, design new strategies to prevent the production of irrelevant literals instead of removing them and using uh, and may, that may be less aggressive that the, than the weakening of ineffective literals. And we can combine uh, the weakening strategies and also the different uh, CDCL strategies I presented to exploit their complementarity and uh, to. Uh, better studies are interactions, for instance, using uh, uh, automatic configuration algorithm. And uh, so here I presented mostly uh, the, uh, the impact of the new strategies in SAT4J and on decision problems. So it would be interesting to, to implement the new strategies in other solvers, such as running SAT, for instance and to study uh, the impact on uh, optimization problems or other problems in general, that uh, decision problems. And as uh, also, it would be interesting to find answer to uh, the open questions I presented, such as how to improve the detection of the optimal back jump level during conflict analysis, and how to deal with the conflictual reason and that may be encountered during conflict analysis. So thanks for your attention. And uh, I will take any questions that you may have. Thanks a lot, Roma, and thanks, Daniel. So I'm, on behalf of everybody, I'm giving you a round of applause. Um, a true deep dive into the inner workings of pseudo-Boolean solving. We had a lot of questions throughout the talk, and it's already fairly late here in Europe, so we should let you off the hook fairly soon, I guess, but are there some final questions from the audience? So I, I, I'll uh, uh, ask one. So you, you, you mentioned it in one line. So when you were discussing the general, uh, this, this is a great talk by the way, the, but you, we, you were mentioning one line, you just um, other ways of applying a cutting plane. So 
so far there's the round to one and then there's the 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 forms the of uh generalized resolution are there any other versions of cutting planes that are, are more uh general that have actually been applied or uh yeah so that's successfully <laughs> So uh, current, implemented in current PB solvers, there all only as a version based on generalized resolution or the implementation of running set with the division and the one to one. And uh, the really the main lack in this uh, in PB solvers is the fact that they do not implement the addition rule that allow to combine any uh, kind of uh, constraint without having to uh, having clashing literals to cancel out. And this is really because uh, this uh, little, this is how the CDCL architecture works. We perform a, a cancellations uh, along the trail. And the, the main uh, perspective, I think, uh, is to try to find a way to implement a general addition rule in Solvet. Thanks. So just to follow up on this question, just like also when you about other cutting plane systems. So what about um, what do they do in integer programming, for example? Are those techniques applicable here? I'm not really uh, familiar with, uh, okay. with integer yeah, so, programming solvers. Yeah, so this is what so, I was curious about. I just I know that they apply lots of cutting planes during their algorithm, but I don't know exactly the details. I was just hoping if there's some discussion on that, but okay. So I could, uh, so, so the the point is that you don't have, the, you they, they do add lots of cutting planes, but they do it during mm -hmm. the search phase. Uh, they mm -hmm. don't have this kind of, so what they totally don't have is uh, this conflict analysis based on linear constraints that pseudo Boolean solvers have. This seems to yeah. be entirely lacking. They do have a conflict analysis, but to the best of my understanding, after talking to people who actually know mm -hmm. um, how MIP solvers work and implement them, uh, they the way MIP solvers do conflict analysis is that they extract clausal reasons for everything. And then they basically run CDCL, mm -hmm. which, which is much, much weaker than what Roman described. But then on the other yeah. hand, what, what they will do on during the search phase, they will, you know, they will solve LP relaxations and then repeatedly add cutting planes and resolve the LP relaxations. And this is something that um, pseudo Boolean solvers have traditionally not been doing at all. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so I think they do the LP and then they try to make a cutting plane that improves their LP. But this is not applicable like in the CDCL setting, I suppose. Um, I, so, I mean, we have a paper that does this, this self-advertising, a paper that is constrained with-, <laughs> yeah, with but, the, but I meant for like in the conflict analysis, like specifically. In the yeah. conflict analysis, well, conflict analysis is doing cutting planes, right? I mean, what, what we're describing, saturation and division are both mm -hmm. cutting planes. Uh, so in that sense, it is, you know, it is some kind of, it is already applying cutting planes rules, but it's doing it differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and I, and I think the, the main issue we have currently is uh, that we produce those uh, irrelevant literals. And this is really, uh, so we need to find a way to prevent uh, producing those uh, irrelevant reports. And, um, and so maybe the rules are good, but just uh, the way we are uh, applying them, there are maybe some cases where we should not, or we should uh, weaken before. Uh, they are, we probably need to find a new, uh, yeah, new settings or new, new constraints before new rule, well, to adapt the rules maybe. Uh, to apply them uh, in, in a city cell context. I mean, so, somewhat related also to this is that you could certainly envision, this is not quite what I think you were asking about, Demir, but uh, 
you could take the rich library of different cut rules that exist in mixed integer linear programming. And you could say, well, what if I don't want to use saturation or division, or I want to use some other cut rule? Yeah, this, exactly. you could yes. this you could totally do. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, well, unless there are exciting news from Lance forthcoming, I don't think this has been done. Mm -hmm. Okay. And just a, it's, just it's a, certainly conceivable to do it. Okay, so it, just would, like be, it would be interesting to do it. Mm -hmm. And just a follow-up question. So this is maybe beyond the scope of the talk itself, but just a, if somebody could comment. So if you want to do this kind of CDCL for integer, um, so here we're doing pseudo Boolean, but if you have like an integer constraint or a linear constraint, is there a way that one can do the CDCL style with integer constraints? With linear integer constraints. Well, there's this bound so propagation, which is uh, mm -hmm. there's a couple of papers on this, uh, but um, I don't think it's it's neither competitive for the MIPS thing, but also not competitive for mm -hmm. the for the pseudo boolean. But like there are people in the Kate community have been working on this. So Newman Hoyes and Konstantin Kowalin and Wokonkov. So, yeah, there's a paper by Demura De and Jovanovic. Yeah, exactly, like, that's cut, the cutting thing. cutting to the chase it's, of. It's actually worse. So this is, I mean, but it somehow doesn't seem to fly. It it doesn't three, seem to work three, in practice. Three groups which have exactly tried that. Yeah, I mean, there's also this inset approach which tries to just kind of resolve a linear inequalities and hopes that it gets a conflict, but it's not guaranteed to actually get it. And, but it seems like, as that means said, these things never seem to be as competitive as other techniques for the. Okay, I was just wondering if there are any other comments. Well, I have one comment, but I couldn't find the paper. I thought it was by Laktar, but by Daniel's uh, colleague. Where yeah. he had like a way of um, reducing the the back jump level, even in CDCL, by kind of doing a cyclic resolution, yeah. and you allowed it in one particular case. And the surprising yeah. fact there was that this never worked. Also, Lactos uh, figured that out. So it's completely clear, sort of like, at least in that context, like going for the best uh, back jump level was not. So they have a paper on this, but they, they only have negative results. And I also had this, and it was completely unclear to me why, why reducing the conflict level is counterproductive. Anyhow, so I couldn't find the paper. So I look, I, I, maybe somebody has, do you recall it, Daniel, or I don't know. Yeah, but I think that this is a paper in 2008, no, or something. Yeah, some, some, uh, but I, I, I couldn't find it. So it's a pretty old one, yes. Uh, I, I think it's a paper at, uh, uh, Iktai, no? I think it's Iktai 08 or something like this. But uh, yes, it's uh, Lagdar, Gilles, and uh, Said, I think. Uh, yeah. Okay. Any other comments or questions before I think we, I mean, I think we deserve the right to call this a day, but just to give a final opportunity to people. So then I think let's just thank you again for uh, uh, an amazing seminar. Thank you so much. And for, for uh, I think it's, you know, my take on this, I'm obviously biased, but this is, shows that there are so many, Good questions that could be discussed either immediately now after the talk on, on Gather Town or you know in some other venue at the at the Simons. So thank you, thank you again so much for the seminar. Bye. Bye.